So let's move on to take care of our first example where we're going to be working with uh, an equation and two inequalities. Of course, um, we're incorporating some function notation here, and the functions that we're using are both linear functions. Uh, for instance, uh, f of x here is defined as 3x plus 5. Of course, that's in that format mx plus b. Uh, so overall, f of x is a linear function. Uh, g of x is also a linear function because it follows that format mx plus b. All right, in example part a, we're going to be solving an equation, f of x is equal to g of x. All right, so I'll show you how to solve this algebraically, and then I will uh, touch on the concept behind it, because uh, getting to that next level is definitely where I'd like us to be. Um, not only just solving the problem, but understanding you know, what the solution really means uh, in terms of the context. Uh, so here's how you do it. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to replace f of x with what it's defined as, and that's the expression 3x plus 5. So I'm going to go ahead and change or swap out f of x to 3x plus 5. And we're going to set that equal to the expression for g of x, um, which g of x is defined as negative 2x plus 15. So we'll just replace the function notation for g of x with negative 2x plus 15. And then we're off to the races. Uh, we basically just have a linear equation on our hands, and of course we're going to isolate x, and as soon as we do, we'll have our answer to part a. So to solve this, I think what I'm going to do is add 2x to both sides. So on the left we'd have 5x plus 5, and on the right we'd have 15. Next what I'll do is subtract 5 from both sides to get 5x equals 10, and then upon dividing by 5 to both sides we get x equals 2, and that's our answer. All right, so algebraically or mechanically, it's not all that difficult to solve uh, this type of problem involving linear functions, but the concept is this. You know, we want to figure out, is there any particular value of x that makes the output of the function f equal to the output uh, g of x, all right? And based on our algebra, x equals 2 should be the um, one input value that makes the output of both functions the same. And what I'd like to do is go ahead and verify that in kind of a form of a note here. So what I'm trying to allude to is that when we plug 2 into our function f of x, it should give us the same value as if we were to plug 2 into the function g of x, according to our algebra. All right, well, plugging 2 into the function f of x turns it into 3 times 2 plus 5, which is 6 plus 5, giving us 11. Plugging 2 into the, the function g of x, we'd have negative 2 times 2 plus 15, uh, yielding negative 4 plus 15, which is 11. And so you can see we got the same output from these two different functions um, using the input value of 2. All right, so there is a particular input value that makes the outputs identical. That input value is 2, and the identical output is 11. Let's move on to example part B. So the idea is kind of the same. Of course, we are in an inequality uh, situation, which changes the concept quite a bit. But from a mechanical standpoint, what we're going to start things out with doing is replacing f of x with the expression 3x plus 5. And say that that's less than 0. Now let's go ahead and solve for x. We'll subtract x, I'm sorry, 5 from both sides to get 3x is less than negative 5 and then divide both sides by 3 to get x is less than negative 5 thirds. Now, of course, you want to keep your basic rules of inequalities in mind still. If this 3 were negative, you'd have to reverse the inequality symbol. All right, but it's not, so we'll keep the inequality symbol the same. And what I would uh, much prefer is actually the interval notation versus the inequality notation version of the solution. Um, so with that said, the interval notation for this answer is negative infinity comma negative five-thirds and parentheses on the negative infinity by default and parentheses on the negative five-thirds because we're working with a strict inequality in other words there's no bar underneath it so that's our answer in interval notation and one major difference between problem a and problem b is that in problem a we only had one value of x and that's kind of to be expected because we were solving an equation. 
But in part B, we were solving an inequality. And based on our uh, isolation of x, you know, so long as it's a value that's less than negative 5 thirds, it's an answer to this inequality. Uh, so there are actually many, many values of x that solve this uh, inequality. In fact, infinitely many of them. And so long as it's a value of x that's between negative infinity and negative 5 thirds, um, that's going to be an answer. So that's one major difference. Uh, another major difference is um, the concept behind this inequality. Um, what I'd like to remind you about is something we discussed early in the course, and that is um, how to interpret the inequality symbol from a graphical standpoint, as well as what a zero stand for uh, in a graphical um, perspective. Uh, first of all, the less than sign right here you know, we're going to look at a graph in just a moment, but I want you to interpret the less than symbol as f of x being under, and then the zero standing for x-axis. So basically what we're trying to do is figure out what are the values of x that force the graph of f of x to be underneath the x-axis. All right, so based on our algebra, those are going to be values that are between negative infinity and negative 5 thirds. Let's go ahead and just see about that. So what I'm going to do right now is draft up a coordinate plane. And I'll quickly sketch the graph of f of x, noting that f of x is in slope-intercept form. The y-intercept is 5, and the slope is 3. So the graph is a line, first of all, and it's going to cross the y-axis at y equals 5. And the fact that it has a slope of 3, or 3 over 1, means that the graph is going to be slanted upward, going from left to right. So satisfying both those at the same time, you know, we'd have something to this effect, as for the graph of f of x. So what you should notice is that there is a part of the graph of this line that is underneath the x-axis. All right, And it's this piece that is to the left of the x-intercept here. Which, by the way, this x-intercept, you would find that it's negative 5 thirds, which happens to be part of our uh, solution here, um, the, in the interval notation. But more importantly, it's what is happening to the left of the x-intercept here. This part of the graph of f of x is entirely underneath the x-axis. So from a graphical standpoint, you know, this is something we'd be interested in. You know, this is a part of the graph such that f of x is less than 0. Or stated differently, all the y values on this part of the graph are negative. All right, so this is a piece of the graph we'd be interested in. And in terms of, you know, what are the answers, uh, if we were to solve this from a graphical perspective, well, they would be all the x values that correspond to this part of the line. And those x values that correspond to it go from negative infinity all the way up to negative 5 thirds. All right, and again, since we are dealing with a strict inequality and there's no bar, you know, if you wanted to put either a bracket or parenthesis on the negative five thirds, you know, you'd be forced to use a parenthesis if I could squash it in there. And there we have it. All right, so that's the idea behind part B, which is quite different than the idea in part A. You know, we just want to figure out an x value that uh, makes the outputs of each function the same in part A. Well, in part B, we want to figure out x values that make the function, uh, the function graph go underneath the x-axis, or in other words, x values that produce outputs that are negative. All right, let's move on to part C, and we'll solve it algebraically, and then I'll explain the concept behind it. All right, so for part C, we have... Um, f of x is greater than g of x, so just like with part a and part b, uh, we'll replace f of x with 3x plus 5, and we'll set that greater than uh, the expression for g of x, which is negative 2x plus 15. So it throws us in another linear, uh, linear inequality situation, and a lot of the steps that we do to solve for x here are going to be very similar to uh, how we did it in part a. Um, so with that said, I'm going to add 2x to both sides to make the left-hand side 5x plus 5, and still greater than, and on the right-hand side is 15. Now what I'll do is subtract 5 from both sides to get 5x is greater than 10, 
and dividing both sides by five, no need to reverse the inequality symbol, we get x is greater than two. So in interval notation, that'd be parentheses two, comma, infinity. All right, so again, kind of to be expected, uh, we have infinitely many solutions here, but in particular, you know, um, the values of x that satisfy the inequality are those that are strictly between two and positive infinity. All right, so what I'd like to do next is explain the concept behind this kind of problem. I'm gonna do some sketching of graphs again. So here comes coordinate plane, sorry about it being kind of sloppy. Uh, let's go ahead and whip up the graph of f of x again. Okay, so I'll just kind of borrow the graph from uh, part B's explanation. All right, so there's a quick sketch of f of x. I'd also like to go ahead and uh, quickly draft up the graph of g of x, which is defined as negative 2x plus 15. Now 15 is the y-intercept, so it's going to cross the y-axis a little bit higher than um, where f of x crosses it. Uh, but also the slope is negative, so this, this line is going to uh, slant downward going from left to right. So combining those two ideas together, you know, what we'd see as a rough sketch of g of x is a line that's going down um, as we travel left to right and having a larger y-intercept than the y-intercept of f of x. So, um, so what is the idea behind solving the inequality f of x is greater than g of x and how does it all relate to our graph that we have right now? Well, in the spirit of example part b, um, if less than meant under, greater than is going to mean above. So one way of interpreting this inequality is to say, all right, well, are there any parts of the graph of f of x that are above uh, the graph of g of x? All right, well, in our diagram, one item that's gonna be helpful for us is this point of intersection. All right, and at this point of intersection, you know, that's when both the output of f of x and g of x are exactly the same. And we kind of have an idea of the x value that makes that happen, and that's from part A. Um, we know that when x is equal to 2, both the output of f of x and g of x are the value of, is the value 11. All right, so what I'm going to do is actually put a little tick mark at x equals 2. Hopefully that won't tick anybody off. And I'm also going to flesh out the ordered pair of this point of intersection. It's 2 comma 11. So what's important about noting the point of intersection is that on uh, either side of it, you know, the behaviors of the graph are a little bit different, um, which will allude to, you know, us solving this uh, from a graphical perspective, this inequality that is. Uh, if you look directly to the left of the point of intersection, you know, we have the orange graph above the green graph. So to, to the left of the point of intersection, this is a situation where g of x is greater than f of x which is exactly the opposite of what our inequality is for part C. All right, so the diagram to the left of the point of intersection is not of interest. However, uh, to the right of the point of intersection, that's when we start to see the graph of f of x being above the graph of g of x. So it's exactly this part of the graph of f of x that is gonna help us uh, sort of verify our answer here. Um, this is a part of the graph of f of x that has us uh, seeing that f of x is greater than or above the graph of g of x. All right, so again, to the right of this point of intersection, this is when we start to see the graph of f of x being above the graph of g of x, which is exactly what our inequality uh, is asking us to observe. Now, that's the first phase. The second and final phase is to um, color in or um, shade the x values that correspond to this part of the graph of f of x and also at the same time this part of g of x. And those would be the values of x that go from 2 all the way down to positive infinity. All right, and again, since we're working with a strict inequality, if you wanted to put something on 2, you'd have to put a parenthesis on it. All right, and so here we're seeing uh, three majorly different uh, concepts in these three uh, parts of the example. Uh, of course, you know, the algebra isn't all that bad, but the concept is the next level I need you guys to be at, 
um, because this idea of above and below either the x-axis or a different functions graph uh, is going to play a key role in what we do later on in the course. Uh, but for now, that's where I'm going to stop the video. I'll be posting another video with example two that's towards the bottom of the page. Uh, please let me know if you have any questions. I'd be happy to answer those uh, the next time we meet. Otherwise, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Thank you.